students welcome to this lecture number 21 of VLSI design KEC 072. I am Dr. Raman Kapoor associate professor at ABS engineering college Ghaziabad. Today's topic is the one which is gaining a lot of attention recently which is known as low power CMOS logic circuits. So, let us just see how, why and how the power associated with CMOS circuit is gaining a lot of attention. The fact that I am able to communicate with you in a digital way, you are able to see this content on different medium and different devices that basically means that somewhere power is being consumed at a large scale. Okay. You might be seeing these digital content on your phones, on your laptops which are basically portable devices which are battery powered okay. and whenever something which is taking a large proportion of its operation time on a portable source of energy, the fact that how much power it consumes or for how long it can continue with its operation that is a very significant parameter in its success. Okay. Now, that is an example of a large scale device. But, where, but from our point of view, when we are talking about power consumption or power dissipation, we are interested in how much power is being consumed by our CMOS circuit, which is nothing but a collection of MOSFETs. Okay. And MOSFET is what? For digital aspect, MOSFET is a switching device, right? a digital switching device which switches from 0 to 1, 1 to 0, it holds zeros, it holds 1, it is able to override zeros to 1. 1s to zeros. Okay. So, how much power is being consumed or dissipated while these operations are taking place? Our analysis affects the large scale devices, but the, our analysis is actually done on the circuit level. Okay. So, functional performance of integrated circuits, it has significantly increased, there is no doubt about that. Year over year, a new technology arrives, a new technology node is started. Okay the average size of devices reduces, the size of your typical MOSFETs reduces, okay. the gate pitch, the distance between source and drain that reduces which allows you to put more and more devices per unit area of silicon. What it does? It provides a lot of functionality in a smaller area and at most of the times at reduced cost also. These kind of scaling trends, increasing performance, is usually done via what is known as downscaling. But now try to visualize if you are putting more number of devices in the same area as before. Suppose if you have 1000 MOSFET in per square millimeter of silicon, if you increase that number from 1000 to say 1 million in the same area, obviously a lot of F effects are going to come into the picture. Okay. If you cram lot of devices in the same area, the devices are going to influence each other in terms of their operation okay. and a major parameter which gets affected is how much power gets dissipated by this arrangement as a whole. Okay. You can talk about a single transistor for your analysis, but the calculation or the final number comes for the entire system. Okay. And since there is an increasing prominence of portable systems electronic gadgets or devices which can carry with you on the go and the limit need to limit power consumption that is heat dissipation. Obviously, when you cram things together you are bound to generate heat okay? and that heat is not a useful signal for us that is basically dissipation. Okay? All these requirements has generated the need for a separate area of study within VLSI design you can have a separate prominent area of study which is known as low power VLSI systems. Okay. Now, the lower power consumption which is needed, it should not affect the requirement of high end performance. Okay. Your output, your functionality should still be high end at simultaneously at reduced power consumption. Okay. So, reducing power dissipation in integrated circuits through design environment improvement is a major challenge in portable system design. Okay. So, now what we are seeing? We are seeing a particular a type of a trade off where we want to put more and more functionality, but then the amount of power consumption which is happening is also going up. 
So, there has to be some kind of an innovative arrangement or some kind of a trade off where you can without compromising on the functionality of your devices, okay, you still keep the power consumption under check. Okay. Now, as I have said power dissipation is a major issue in all high performance digital systems. Such systems usually will have high integration density. Okay. So, there will be lot of components connected very close to each other. Some of them will share the same clock, some of them will be asynchronous with each other. Okay. There will be lot of interconnects, lot of delays happening. Right. Some will be combinational, some will be sequential, some sequential blocks will use combinational circuit. Okay. So, a lot of arrangement will be there okay. and they might have to work on very high frequency also okay. and something which is working on a high frequency is switching on and off. Right. And as you know MOSFET is what? It is basically a capacitor only. It stores, it discharges, it discharges and that switching consumes energy, consumes power. Okay. So, the power dissipation of the chip as a whole and thus the temperature increases with the increase in clock frequency. Right. Reliability issues happen, a larger device, a device with a longer channel which may have less functionality as compared with a device with a short channel with more functionality, okay. but that device with a long channel may be more reliable and predictable the variability will be less. Okay. So, a batch of devices produced may have higher power consumption. Okay. So, then in that case reliability also becomes a major issue. Right. Consequently, when you are trying to uh, mitigate the effects of higher power, other overhead costs also go up. Cost of packaging, how you package your device, cooling mechanism. Okay, so, that excessive heat can be removed, these become significant factor, these are your extra overheads which come when you keep moving higher on the technology ladder. Right. So, low power design methodology, now we have understood why we need to reduce our power consumption. Okay. Now, let us just see what are the metho methodologies available with us, what are the directions in which we can move, what different approaches we can take. Okay. There is not a single approach towards a low power VLSI design, there can be multiple approaches. One particular complex system might use more than one approach for uh, reducing the amount of power consumed. Okay. One way or one methodology for obtaining a low power design is what is when you are working at the device level, okay. when you are working at the transistor level, one individual transistor source, drain, gate, channel, substrate metal oxide semiconductor device. Okay. If it is n channel type, you will have a positive threshold voltage, if it is a p channel device, you will have a negative threshold voltage. You can work your way around with the threshold voltage. Okay. You can work your way with the geometry, device architecture, increase the surface area, increase the surface to volume ratio, okay. so that more heat gets dissipated very easily. You make the device geometry in such a way that the area or the geometry itself allows you to dissipate heat. You toggle or tune the threshold voltage in such a way that your device only turns on when you want it to turn on, this way you are going to lower your power consumption. Okay. Next approach or methodology is what is known as circuit level. Once you connect lot of transistors in a circuit, can you do it on the circuit level also? Use different design styles, use different clocking mechanisms. Okay. In such a way, for example, in one of our previous lectures, we did uh, uh, like C 2 MOS clocked CMOS strategies, which allows you to uh, counter the race condition. Okay. You have dynamic logic, you have domino logic, uh, you have NPC MOS logic or C 2 MOS logic, all these basically different strategies, different design style clocking strategies, which help you to minimize your power consumption architecture level. We have done an example of pipelining, where you design your overall system architecture in such a way that in one clock cycle or in a series of clock cycles, some processes take place in parallel instead of series. Okay. That way you, are, you, you can reduce some time, you can, you can reduce power also for a better power management. Algorithm level, 
okay, where you basically select your data processing algorithm in such a way that the number of switching events are reduced, number of times your circuit goes from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, if you can reduce that you are reducing the probability of your power consumption. Okay. So, these are some of the methodologies, these are some of the directions in which you can move and see how uh, a low power CMOS design can be obtained. Okay. So, our today's and probably the next lecture also will focus on how we can move towards or proceed towards a, a design which does not compromise on functionality, but also reduces the amount of power consumption. Okay. Now, before you can actually minimize something at least you should know its source. Okay. So, in a VLSI in a CMOS circuit the power consumption has three major sources. The first one you can see on the left is the power consumed during switching. Okay. When your digital device is switching from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 how much power it is dissipating that is a switching power. Short circuit power consumption this is generally related to that particular unstable short lived stage okay. in any circuit in any device or system. You can have a small instant or a small duration of time when the power consumption all of a sudden goes up your circuit is sort of unstable or a meta stable and immediately it goes to one of its stable state. That particular small duration of time a lot of power is consumed. Okay. That is usually what comes under the category of short circuit power consumption. Okay. Third is your leakage power consumption which is inherent to miniature devices as the size goes down the path to leak also reduces. The distance an electron has to travel to leak at a useless place that also reduces when you keep on reducing the size. There are different tunneling mechanisms, okay, field related tunneling, direct tunneling. Okay. These are different forms of uh, mechanism which can happen that can leak the useful signal. So, charge gets leaked away and that is a leakage power consumption. Okay. Apart from that also a capacitor if you leave it as charged it might find a path to discharge itself or lose its charge that is also a leakage consumption. Okay. So, these are your three major sources through which in a CMOS circuit you can lose power okay. and if you can minimize one, two or all three of these you are basically saving on the heat dissipation of your device. You will make your device more long lasting and more reliable. Okay. So, let us discuss these three mechanisms one by one. Switching power dissipation is that power which is dissipated during a switching event. When the output node voltage of a CMOS logic gate makes a logic transition, there are two logic states 0 and 1, whenever a transition takes place some power is dissipated. Okay. Switching power is dissipated when energy is drawn from the power supply to charge up the output node capacitance. Okay. During this charge up phase one half of the energy drawn from the power supply is dissipated as heat. Okay. So, when you are charging up some energy which you, so all the energy drawn from a source does not charge your output node some of it is lost as heat also. Okay. The so called law of energy conservation right you cannot create or destroy energy, but you can convert from one form to another. So, when you are charging a load from a power supply not the entire power is going to charge the load some of it will be lost as heat also. And when you are charging down this so called stored energy is also lost as heat. Okay. So, this heat is always generated during switching. So, while going from 0 to 1 some energy is dissipated as heat and while going from 1 to 0 either you charge some other node. So, you transfer that energy there, but even then some of it is lost as heat also. Okay. So, this heat dissipation keeps going on and especially if you have a high frequency circuit which keeps switching very frequently this heat dissipation is going to be at a high level. Okay. So, the average power dissipation of the CMOS logic gate can be calculated from a very simple equation energy required to charge up the output node to the supply okay. that is the maximum you can charge a capacitor. 
Okay. If you supply a if you provide a 5 volt supply that is the maximum voltage you can uh, provide. If, if nothing is lost as heat the capacitor gets fully charged up to 5 volt. Okay. So, so, you charge the output node to VDD your supply voltage and charge down the total output load capacitance to ground level. Okay. These two things you use for average switching power dissipation and the equation which we use for average switching power dissipation is 1 by T load capacitance times square of V D D okay. and 1 by T is the time period of your clock which is nothing but the clock frequency. Okay. So, now you can see when the when high frequency circuits when the clock frequency goes up right when the clock frequency goes up the switching power consumption also goes up right. Usually the V D D supply is generally constant say 3, 5 or 7 volts. Okay. So, that is more expected value. The load capacitance has three components. It has the drain diffusion capacitance plus your interconnect capacitance plus your input capacitance. Okay. So, drain diffusion capacitance are all those parasitic capacitance generally between the uh, your uh, junctions which form with the drain. Okay. Interconnect capacitance is all because of the wires all the wires connecting from input to output or intermediate stages to the final stages. Those are basically pieces of metal. So, if you have one wire running over the other you have two metal wires separated by dielectric produces capacitance interconnect capacitance. Okay. Input capacitance is the uh, gate source capacitances of all the input electrodes. Okay. Of all these three components, the drain diffusion capacitance has the maximum value. So, most of the load capacitance comes from this drain diffusion capacitance. Okay. So, this multiplied by square of V d d by the clock frequency is basically your switching power dissipation. Now, this is a very straightforward, very simpler uh, way of calculating switching power dissipation, but your circuits are way more complex than that. If the charge up from 0 to V d d takes more than one clock cycle, if does not happen in a single clock cycle, the switching power dissipation is modified by a factor alpha, where alpha is the node transition factor, it basically measures how many clock cycles take for your load to charge from 0 to V d d. If it happens in one or less than one clock cycle, alpha goes to 1. If the number of clock cycles to charge your load from 0 to V d d increases, your alpha t keeps on increasing. Okay. So, it measures the number of clock cycles, the node transition factor, it measures the number of clock cycles it takes for your load to charge up. Okay. Going further, okay, so, so adding alpha, adding the node transition factor uh, is one step towards accuracy. Now, there are lot of internal nodes are also there they might not charge at the same time, they might not discharge at the same time. From the input to the output you can have n number of nodes, right. They might charge in different clock cycles, they might charge and discharge simultaneously. Okay. So, if you want to put an average to this, average to the single circuit, right. So, if you have i number of nodes from 1 to i, i represents any internal node. Okay. So, from 1 to i if you summate right, where alpha T i is the node transition factor for the i th node, C i is the load capacitance for the i th node, V i is how much that internal node is charged. Now, this value can vary from 0 to V d d. Okay. That internal node may be fully discharged, a particular internal node may be fully charged. right? times the supply voltage and clock frequency. Summation of all these internal nodes is basically going to give you a single average switching power dissipated when your circuit, your digital circuit makes a logic switch. It goes from 0 to 1, it charges up, it discharges from 1 to 0. An entire summation of all the internal nodes is basically going to give an average switching power dissipation. Okay. So, that is one source where your power gets lost okay, or useful energy gets lost when you are operating any digital system. Okay. 
Next is what is known as a short circuit power dissipation. If the input voltage waveforms have finite rise and fall time, it is possible that both the NMOS and PMOS transistor in any CMOS circuit. So, CMOS is a complementary circuit, it will have both N channel devices and P channel devices, right. Either way, it might it uh, logically one would say if your input voltage is high, your N channel device should be on and PMOS should be off. If your input is low, NMOS should be off and PMOS should be on. When the input is making a transition, there are finite delays, okay. there are finite rise times, fall times, uh, the N type or P type MOSFETs take finite time to charge and discharge. There is a very small duration of time when in a so called complementary circuit your both NMOS and PMOS are on. If you remember the voltage transfer characteristic of an inverter, if you remember your bistable latch element, there is a metastable state in these circuits. Okay. When both NMOS and PMOS are in saturation for a very small amount of time and when they are on they consume lot of power, but this is a very short lived stage. Immediately your circuit goes to one of the stable states either 0 or 1. But for that particular instant or very very small duration of time, you will see a spike in your power consumption okay. and that in a very high density circuit, in a very fast moving circuit, high frequency circuit, those spikes can occur very frequently and that adds to your power dissipation. This so called power uh, consumption is known as short circuit power dissipation. Okay. Now, how we calculate it? Consider a symmetric CMOS inverter which has the same k value. Okay. If you remember the k value of any MOSFET, if you remember the equation for drain source current, k is what is mu C ox W by L. W by L is your aspect ratio, mu is mobility, C ox is oxide capacitance. So, it is a material parameter basically. Okay. It is a, a parameter which is dependent on your dimensions of the MOSFET how much mobility, how much oxide, basically all the physical dimension contribute to the value of k. Okay. So, a CMOS inverter with the same value of k for both N and P type device, same magnitude of threshold voltage, okay. sign will be different, but magnitude I am saying is same. Right. It is driven by a symmetric input which has same rise and fall time. For such an arrangement, the short circuit current which is drawn from the power supply is given by this equation. Now, do not worry about the derivation and all you just have to uh, kind of keep these things in mind that you are measuring some kind of a current here. So, k will have some units then this time and frequency will cancel out you will have a voltage here and a cube of voltage here. So, once you do all the uh, units on either side you will you will match your equation. Okay. So, you are measuring the current drawn from this kind of a symmetric CMOS inverter with a symmetric input. This much current is being drawn. K I have already told you, tau is your rise time and fall time, okay. clock frequency, supply voltage, supply voltage and threshold voltage. Okay. Just use the magnitude. Right. The short circuit power dissipation in that case is known as, okay. so power is voltage times current. So, if I multiply this current with VDD, I am going to get this expression. Okay. So, power is current times voltage. Okay. This gives you your short circuit power dissipation in a circuit. Right. So, we have done switching power, we have done how to, uh, what, what are the origins of switching power, how you calculate it, you can calculate an average value for it also. We have done what is a short circuit power dissipation and we have an expression for that also, okay, a mathematical expression. Right. Third component of power dissipation is what is known as leakage power. Okay. Now, leakage power or leakage current or leakage charge whatever you want to call it, that is gaining a lot of attention because we have very fast in a very significant way we have reduced the device dimensions. Okay. If you have say a channel length of 1 micron between source and drain and if you reduce that to say 10 nanometers, okay, obviously there are lot of interactions going to happen between the charge carriers. 
if you are reducing the oxide thickness from say 100 nanometer to 10 nanometer, there is a very high probability that even if your device is off before it turns on, some of the charge can leak away through the metal electrode, your so called direct tunneling. Okay. So, these kind of tunneling effects of the useful charge carriers, where your charge carrier should actually be moving from source to drain, it is leaking away at different places. You are losing charge, you are losing current and you are wasting power. That dissipation is known as your leakage power dissipation. Okay. So, all these leakage currents, uh, if you broadly want to categorize them, they would have two sources. One is what is known as reverse saturation current. Okay. Wherever you have a p n junction, wherever you have a p and n type region in proximity, there is going to be a depletion region. If that junction is reverse biased, there is going to be a reverse saturation current and that is your current which should not be flowing actually. Your diode is expected to be off in reverse bias condition, but some reverse saturation current flows. Okay. So, that is a leakage. Next is your sub threshold current. That current which flows across a MOSFET when the value of threshold voltage, the value of gate voltage, gate source voltage is actually lower than its threshold voltage. Okay. So, even if your NMOS is not on, it is still below threshold, the gate source voltage is below threshold, some current is being observed, that is a leakage current. Okay. So, this type of current is known as a sub threshold current. Any high density VLSI chip which has a very large number of transistors these currents can contribute to the overall power dissipation, even if no switching is happening, even if your no metastable state is there, no activity is taking place in the circuit in your MOSFET, but still some power is getting dissipated. Okay. This is known as leakage power dissipation. Let us just see some of the sources of it, I have just told one reverse saturation current. Okay. So, say you have this uh, P type region here, P type region and N type substrate here. Okay. So, between this P and N, there is going to be a P N junction. Between this N well and this P type substrate, there is going to be a P N junction. Okay. Uh, if you make the, say if you consider an N MOS type of a transistor, the drain is uh, positively charged which is N type, substrate which is P type is grounded. So, that is a reverse bias junction. Same happens for a P MOS device the P plus highly doped P type drain is applied negative voltage, the N type substrate is grounded that is a reverse bias junction, some reverse saturation current flows through these junctions, that is your leakage current. Okay. So, wherever you have this drain substrate junction or in this kind of a device where you have two types of substrate, although these substrate both are grounded, so there is no biasing across them, but between drain and substrate there is going to be a reverse biasing when your MOSFET is actually under operation, right? that results in a reverse saturation current. The sub threshold leakage current is, is because of diffusion between source and drain during weak inversion okay? uh, and that basically is a type of a leakage current which should not be flowing. Okay? So, you can see here between the arrow and this actually gains a lot of prominence when the distance between the source and drain is very small, your so called short channel devices. Okay? So, the the distance which an electron has to travel from source to drain or a hole which has to travel from source to drain basically any charge carrier that is going to be very small right and this width also if you see this width of your oxide this oxide here metal oxide semiconductor o, o for oxide that oxide when you reduce the thickness of it a lot of tunneling can take place okay charge carriers can be lost to the metal electrode right so, these all these mechanism they basically produce a sub threshold leakage current. A lot of effort is being done to reduce the sub threshold slope. A lot of devices are being explored, a lot of architectures are being implemented so that the sub threshold slope can be improved okay, or sub threshold leakage current can be minimized. So, with this we come towards the end of today's lecture. We have discussed a very uh, a topic which is gaining a lot of attention these days, the so called low power CMOS VLSI design. We have seen that with scaling with extra functionality, the level of power consumption is significantly increasing. Because of that, you have to come up with different ways, you cannot compromise on performance. So, you have to come up with different ways, whether it is at the device level, circuit level, architecture level or algorithm level, 
and you have to minimize the power consumption. Okay. We have seen broadly three major sources of uh, where power gets dissipated while switching during your meta stable stage where your both N and P type devices are on for a short duration of time and your leakage power dissipation. Okay. In the subsequent lectures, we are going to uh, see techniques which you can use to actually minimize this power consumption. Okay. Thank you.